Hello, hello and welcome back to CS500 Design and Analysis of Algorithms. We're currently talking about parallel algorithms. This is chapter nine. And in this chapter nine, we have learned some very powerful, because very general methods. Namely, we've learned the method of uh, parallel prefix. Parallel prefix allows to compute any n array associative operation using only binary operations within logarithmic parallel time, what we call depth, because we're talking about circuits, and in linear size of the circuit. And recall that both are optimal for information theoretic reasons, because a circuit is an acyclic directed graph. And <clears throat> like trees, with a binary tree, we know <clears throat> that a binary tree of n leaves must have size O of n and must have depth at least O of n. And the same holds for directed acyclic graphs, provided that they are connected in the sense that the result, the root of our circuit really depends on all n inputs. Now you can of course imagine a circuit with an extra input, an n plus first input, which doesn't affect the result at all. Then of course, this statement is uh, truly wrong. That's why we have the hypothesis that the output depends on all n inputs. And then we know that the depth must be at least log n because it's binary gates. It's a circuit comprised of binary operations. And the size must be at least n because the circuit must kind of read all n inputs because it depends on that. We've also seen a strengthening of this called Brent's principle, which says the size must actually be at least the sequential running time of an optimal sequential algorithm, any optimal sequential algorithm. And we'll apply this today and we will apply the parallel prefix method. So let us recall the parallel prefix method and our first application <clears throat> to graph reachability. So here you see a binary tree for computing any associative operation, n array operation in optimal logarithmic depth and in optimal linear size. And you can imagine this operation to be like a generalized sum over all n elements. And the generalization to prefix sum, to parallel prefix is <clears throat> calculating not just the one sum over the entire range, but calculating all partial sums, always starting with the first element ranging up to the n minus first, and another sum ranging up to the n minus second, another sum ranging over the n minus third, so that the input consists of n elements, and now also the output consists of n elements. And we've seen that <coughs> this generalized problem, <coughs> also sometimes called a scan operation, can still be computed in optimal logarithmic parallel time, and in optimal linear size. I won't recall the details of the construction and analysis, but let's also recall some first application. Namely, we have applied this to the graph reachability problem. So if you call graph reachability is classically, that is sequentially solved, 
for example, <clears throat> by uh, Dijkstra's algorithm. But we've also seen that Dijkstra's algorithm has some, some parts that parallelize well, but some parts that are intrinsically sequential. Maybe it proceeds in phases. First, finding all neighbors to the start vertex, which we call S here. <clears throat> this can be maybe done in parallel, but then find all neighbors <clears throat> to, the, to those first order neighbors. And that depends on the previous phase. So <clears throat> that in general, we'll have up to K phases where we're interested in whether <clears throat> and which vertices can be reached within K steps from the start vertex. And this seems hard to, to parallelize. So what we're aiming for is a parallel algorithm with sublinear running time. And to this end, <clears throat> we've um, made use of another example of the power of abstraction, namely, we recall from maybe discrete mathematics that the power of the Boolean adjacency matrix capture iterated reachability, or precisely the kth power as a Boolean <clears throat> matrix power. The entries capture whether there's a path from S to T of length at most K. Well, maybe of length exactly K, but we agree that the adjacency matrix should be equipped with ones on the diagonal, which corresponds to implicitly um, enhancing the input graph with self loops. Then whether vertex is reachable within exactly K steps is the same as the question whether vertex is reachable within at most K steps, because we can always add self loops and similarly, the k Boolean matrix power captures whether there's a path of length at most k. We have thus reduced using just mathematics, the original problem to the problem of calculating Boolean matrix powers. Where Boolean matrix power is repeatedly applying Boolean matrix product. Now you all know of course, Boolean, uh, um, integer matrix product or real matrix product, uh, row times column, where times means inner product, sum over uh, <clears throat> products. And now the Boolean version of that <clears throat> replaces the sum with a disjunction, a big R, and the product with a conjunction, a binary and. And by applying what we've learned before, <clears throat> this <clears throat> big R over N terms can actually be calculated <clears throat> in uh, depth log N in size O of N. The binary conjunction, <clears throat> they don't take much effort, they're just constant depth, right? This is just one Boolean conjunction anyway in a circuit. But this huge disjunction increases the depth only <clears throat> to log n because the disjunction is associative. So all the considerations <clears throat> uh, that we had before apply in particular to the associative disjunction operation. Now doing that not just for one entry with uh, position i comma j in the result matrix, but recovering the entire product matrix, all all pairs i and j, does not affect the depth, but it increases the size from linear to cubic. Yeah, this is basically <clears throat> the, your standard method of uh, <clears throat> matrix multiplication, right? Now we know how to calculate the product of two Boolean matrices in logarithmic <clears throat> depth and cubic size. And in order to <clears throat> then 
calculate the matrix power raised to the kth power, we'll <clears throat> not proceed iteratively, a to the second, a to the third, a to the fourth, a to the fifth, and so on. But we proceed with repeated squaring, called like computing a to the squared, then squaring that, resulting in a to the fourth, then squaring that, resulting in a to the eight, and so on, so that after log k paces, log k sequential repetitions, one arrives at a to the k. This is the sequential process, but we only need to do that log k times so that the parallel time grows from log n for one matrix product to log n times log k. And that's highly efficient. The size also grows because we here we need to repeat the circuit for this one Boolean matrix product of size n cubed, log k times. Recall that in circuits, there are no loops. Uh, it's a directed acyclic graph. So if we want to express a loop, we have to uh, include <clears throat> copies of the original circuit repeatedly. And in this case, log k loops means log k repetition means the size increases by a factor of log k. So in conclusion, based on our <clears throat> Uh, efficient parallel algorithm for any n array associative operation. We arrive at a very efficient parallel algorithm for graph reachability with depth log n times log k. And just remember, in the worst case, k is n. Doesn't make sense to ask for reachability within more vertices than there are present at all. And if we have a graph, let's say of 1 billion entries, then the binary logarithm of 1 billion is 30 roughly. And <clears throat> log n times log k would be at most 900. So after 900 clock cycles or parallel circuit, we'll and be able to answer whether in this graph with 1 billion vertices, one can come from S to T. Another application is the uh, replicary adder. Recall <clears throat> we want to add numbers in binary or in decimal, long numbers. The high school method, long addition, involves carry, right? You add the first two least significant digits, and maybe there's a carry. So when adding the next significant digits, then you might actually need to add three numbers, the two input digits plus the carry from the previous one. And that in turn could <clears throat> incur a carry, and that carry could continue walking, rippling from digit to digit up to the most significant digit. And thus the result, the most significant digit result can depend on the carry of the previous, which can depend on the carry of the previous and so on. So <clears throat> this is a in intrinsically sequential problem. Let's formalize this. The input, let's say consists of two n-bit integers in binary, A and B, and the output, is supposed to be the sum of the two integers, again in binary. And this might be one bit longer because of uh, set carry. And we want to express that. We want to design a circuit performing this sum, long addition, using only the Boolean binary connective, binary conjunction, binary disjunction, and negation. And this can be done sequentially using a replicary adder in linear sequential time, which is optimal because any algorithm must look at all input bits 
the output depends on all input bits. If the algorithm misses only one bit, then it will be incorrect. And here you see a circuit um, representing the sequential operation where you see the carry rippling forward from least significant digit on and on and on <clears throat> up to the most significant digit and thus affecting uh, <clears throat> also the result. Now this picture looks like it's <clears throat> they are all on the same level, but actually the depth cre increases, grows with every <clears throat> more significant digit so that the depth of this circuit is actually linear so it's not <clears throat> very efficient as a parallel algorithm because of this intrinsic sequential <clears throat> uh, carry rippling operation. And our goal is to accelerate that, to make really use of the parallelism. And this is, can be done using a, with a so-called carry look-ahead adder. Carry look-ahead adder is basically the adder that we had before with some miracle additional uh, logic gate that is able to predict all the carries in advance. And once all the carries are known in advance, then of course <clears throat> it's easy and very fast to calculate the final results because now uh, we only need to take any two input bits, add them together with a pre-calculated carry and thus the result appears in constant parallel time. Here you see another uh, depiction of this carry look-ahead adder. So once all carries have been predicted correctly, then the rest is easy in a sense. So we will focus on how to predict the carries efficiently, namely in logarithmic depth and linear size, because then Obtaining the final result only adds constant parallel time, all these operating simultaneously. And the size also grows only linearly because all these have constant size and there are linearly many of these full adders. So how can we predict the carry efficiently? To this end, <clears throat> let us consider two signals, so to say, speak. Namely, one signal at each stage that captures whether this stage generates a new carry. Now, generating a carry that happens if both input bits at that stage are one, because then they add up to two, which means there's a carry. So if at stage i, both ai and bi are true, expressed with this conjunction both, then we say the stage i generates a carry that is then fed into the next stage i plus one. And there's another case <clears throat> where carry can enter into stage i plus one, namely if there had been a carry present before at the previous stage, at stage i minus one. And this carry at stage i, hypothetical carry at stage i minus one, propagates on, on to stage i plus one if, if at least one of the two input bits on stage i is one. That is, if a i is one or if b i is one. Then combined together, they this or ensures that the previous possible previous carry is propagated on, indicated by the symbol pi, onto the stage number i plus one. Now we can express this with two equations from stage i minus one if a carry has been generated and if it is propagated through stage i, then it proceeds on to stage i plus one, or if a carry is generated at stage i, generated, then it also proceeds to get stage i plus one. So that this expression <clears throat> captures how carries proceed 
when they are generated. This expression <clears throat> captures how carries propagate. Namely, a carry propagates if it propagates from stage i minus one via st stage i, then it propagates to stage i plus one. So both propagators have to be true. Now this is the formula for stage i, and we can compose this formula to stage i plus one, i plus two, and thus we can predict the carries at any stage as composition of these formulas. But these nested, then further and further nested formulas become more and more complicated and hard to evaluate. Evaluating such a formula again is something intrinsically sequential. On the other hand, let us introduce, so the goal is to calculate all the generated <coughs> carries in parallel. And let us formalize this, how carries, hypothetical carries propagate and how they are generated on any stage i, depending on the previous stage i minus one and pass on to the next stage i plus one. And let us use the symbol p and g without a prime to indicate the previous stage i minus one, g and p prime indicate the current stage number i, and g prime double prime and p double prime indicate the next stage i plus one. Then we can combine these two expressions into one formula on pairs of bits, namely taking the propagating symbol p and the generating symbol from stage i minus one, and the propagating symbol p prime and generating a signal g prime from the current stage to derive the generating uh, signal g double prime and the propagating signal p double prime for the next stage using this expression which captures this, combines these two into pairs of bits. So that here we have an operation on pairs of bits. And what we're interested in is one part of the result, but on all stages. So that means we're interested in repeatedly applying this operation, not only for from no primes and one prime, but also from double prime, triple prime, quadruple prime, and so on. A big n array uh, version of this operation. That will give the result of the final carry, n array. But we want the result of the carry at any stage, also at stage n minus one, n minus two, and so on. So that indeed, this is a case of the parallel prefix problem. Based on repeatedly applying this binary operation on pairs of bits. And the good news about this operation is that it is satisfies the associativity requirement that we had for our parallel prefix algorithm. It is also idempotent. And together, it means that our abstract, general, powerful consideration for prefix sum apply in particular to this arguably strange operation, which means one can calculate all the predicted carries simultaneously using the prefix sum algorithm in optimal logarithmic depth, parallel runtime, and in optimal linear size based on binary of these operations. So this is kind of the miracle behind the carry look ahead adder, namely the parallel uh, <clears throat> prediction of all the carries on all stages uh, with uh, in logarithmic parallel time. Now, technically, this only shows that carry predictor exists, and therefore carry look ahead adders exist. Expressing them in detail, <clears throat> spelling this out. <clears throat> Uh, this construction in combination with the parallel prefix operation is uh, still 
work, manual work, which we will not <clears throat> um, go into further, maybe leave it to a homework or a midterm exam. The message for here is one can calculate, one can add n-bit binary numbers in logarithmic parallel time and in linear, optimal linear size because of the power of abstraction. Let us now move on to another example of parallel algorithms, namely this time parallel algorithm for sorting. If you've <clears throat> watched or taking the course CS300 introduction to algorithm with me, you may <clears throat> have already seen the first part, namely uh, parallel version of bubble sort. So let's recall the parallel sorting circuit and parallel bubble sort first. So the primitive of a sorting circuit is this, this gate, which takes two input signals, read from left to right, and compares them. If they're already in correct order, as in this example, then they are left as they are. If they are wrong order, then the gate switches the two signals and returns them in correct order. Formally, the semantics of such a gate is compare lines N and M, where N is greater than M. If the input on line N is smaller than the input on line M, then they're in wrong order, then the gate will swap them, otherwise leave them as they are. So this how a gate works for sorting two elements where X is a totally ordered set. Here you see a circuit built from these gates, a circuit for sorting four elements. So this circuit first compares these two input lines, also compares these two. And in the example, the input is three, two, four, one. So the first comparison will leave the elements as they are. The next comparison will detect that their input signals are in wrong order, it will swap them. Then this comparison compares the first and second input signal and this one compares the third and fourth simultaneously. And they can do that simultaneously because they operate on different um, input lines. Actually, also these two can operate concurrently because the first one operates on input line one and three, and this one on input line two and four, which are disjoint. But these two comparisons have to be completed before these two happen, because these two take as input the signals from these lines. <clears throat> and so the first... <clears throat> comparison must be completed. And similarly, the last comparison can only happen after these two have finished, so that this as a circuit has depth three. A circuit of depth three for sorting this particular input, three, two, four, one. And I leave it to you, I encourage you to verify, to confirm that actually this circuit does not only sort this particular input, but any input of four uh, signals, any four numbers, any four elements from this totally sorted X element uh, set X will at the end be sorted so that this is a, a sorting circuit for sorting four elements. If we want to sort five elements, we're gonna need a different circuit. So this is one of the main differences between algorithms and circuits. An algorithm can have loops and then therefore can process a arbitrary, a variable number of input data, whereas a circuit, one circuit, can only process the circuit number of inputs. Every gate um, operates only once, and then kind of the <clears throat> operation moves on to the next stage of the circuit. If we want to express a loop in a circuit, then we have to uh, repeat, we have to include um, copies uh, one after the other of the circuit <clears throat> performing one 
expressing one uh, uh, execution of the loop body and then followed by the same circuit again for the next iteration of the loop body. Okay, so this was our example. Let's now see how we can generate um, sorting circuits of arbitrary size. And to this end, we take our favorite sequential algorithms, turn them into circuits and see whether and how well they parallelize. And the first algorithm we take for this purpose is bubble sort. So <clears throat> here's a bubble sorting network. And you see how this arises from bubble sort because bubble sort compares the first two elements and swaps them if they're uh, in wrong order, then the next two, then the next two, and so on. And then it starts over again at the first two, next two, but this time the, the inner loop only needs to go up to here. And in the next iteration of the outer loop, the inner loop only goes here, then only here, and then only here, the two nested loops of bubble sort. So the correctness of this sorting network follows from correctness of bubble sort. Let's now analyze the size and depth of this sorting network. The size, the number of gates is the same as the number of comparisons of bubble sort, which is quadratic. And the depth, the depth is better than the sequential running time of bubble sort. It's only linear because Observe, once this comparison has finished and this gate is also done, when this gate operates, then simultaneously we, this gate already can also start working because it operates on data which is disjoint from the data provided by this gate and the subsequent gates of the first inner, <coughs> inner loop. Also, when this gate operates, then already the next uh, iteration of the outer loop can move on with the second inner loop and perform this comparison. And when this comparison happens, simultaneously this one can happen and this one can also happen. So we can kind of overlay the different phases, the different uh, <clears throat> iterations of the inner loops or in bubble sort and thus harnessing parallelism, accelerating bubble sort from quadratic to linear time. On the other hand, linear time is not what we're really um, satisfied with. We want sublinear time parallel algorithms, maybe even logarithmic time um, <clears throat> parallel algorithms. Now, what can we hope for? Well, according to Brent's principle, the size of a sorting circuit will always be larger or equal to the optimal time, the optimal sequential time, and the optimal sequential time is n log n for sorting, as we know. So the optimal size we can hope for in a sorting network is n log n, and that should be our goal. Also, what depth, what parallel running time can we hope for? The best we can hope for is logarithmic depth. So let's go for that by trying to parallelize another, a different of our classical sequential sorting algorithm. So the next algorithm we try to uh, parallelize is quick sort. And the nice thing about quicksort is that it is recursive, which uh, gives rise to a recursive construction of a sorting circuit. So imagine this sorting circuit that takes n inputs, splits them in two, and then recursively sorts the first half and the second half. This is basically how quicksort works, only that in quicksort, Sorting the first half elements and sorting the second half elements happens one after the other sequentially, whereas here 
we can sort the first n half elements while simultaneously sorting the second n half elements, making use of parallelism because of a divide and conquer. On the other hand, for quick sort <clears throat> to split the two <clears throat> input uh, the input into two parts efficiently requires a smart choice of the pivot, a smart way of halving in the divide and conquer uh, stage. And if we choose the pivot naively, then the input array is not split evenly. And in the worst case, actually one half has maybe can have constant size and the other half can be still asymptotically as large as the original input where so that nothing is gained. So the, the crucial card part in quicksort is really finding a good pivot that allows to divide the input data in, into two parts, the first part, which is smaller, and the second part, which is larger. And in quick sort, we achieved that using the very smart um, linear time median algorithm, which was actually two algorithms that recursively call each other. For sorting networks, we don't know how to efficiently split the input sequence into these two parts, such that the first part is smaller and the second part is larger and they have the same size. So, yeah, what are we gonna do? Let's try parallelizing some other n log n sorting, sequential sorting algorithm. Let me, let's look at merge sort. So merge sort is basically quick sort with the flow of data reversed. So here we first split the input data into two halves and then sort each half individually. In merge sort, we first sort the first half and the second half, and then we merge them into one sorted output. And again, in traditional merge sort, the sorting the two halves of the input happens sequentially. Here we can do it in parallel. But same as with quicksort, now the question arises, how can we efficiently merge these two <clears throat> half uh, subsequences in parallel? To this end, let's consider <clears throat> a particular class of sequences. Sequences that are <clears throat> so-called bitonic. Bitonic means that the sequence is first increasing and then decreasing. And when I say increasing, I actually mean non-decreasing. When I say decreasing, I actually mean non-increasing. And the switching point where the increasing sequence <clears throat> becomes the decreasing one can be arbitrary anywhere in the array. It doesn't have to be strictly at the midpoint. This is called a bitonic sequence. Here's an example of a bitonic sequence. It is first increasing and then decreasing. A sequence is also called bitonic if it is first decreasing and then increasing. Here you see an example of another bitonic sequence, which is first decreasing and then increasing. And now let's <clears throat> try to construct a um, circuit for <clears throat> um, parallel merge sort that creates <clears throat> at the first stage such a bitonic sequence. Maybe let's we construct that by induction. Let's suppose we already have a circuit for sorting n over two elements and use that here and use that here. But actually we're going to use the circuit here mirrored like this, flipped along the x-axis. This is indicated by this bar. So by induction hypothesis, this circuit produces a uh, increasing output sequence from the first half of the input. And this one, indicated by the ball, produces a 
decreasing output sequence of the second half of the input. So that after this first stage, inductively, we actually do have a platonic sequence. Maybe one that is increasing here and one that is decreasing here at this stage. And now we need to merge that. So now the original challenge has been switched. Originally, the goal was to merge two sorted sequences to increasing. Now the goal is to sort a bitonic, to merge a bitonic sequence into a sorted one. A bitonic merger here. So let's <clears throat> construct a bitonic merger. The bitonic merger again is <clears throat> constructed recursively. First, <clears throat> we apply comparison gates um, <clears throat> from the first half to the second half of the input. So the first input is compared to the <clears throat> uh, first input after the half. The second is compared to the first <clears throat> input after the second half and so on. So these are the comparison gates. And then after that, <clears throat> We apply the merger, the bitonic merger, recursively and simultaneously to the first uh, and half <clears throat> uh, intermediate results and simultaneously to the second and over two intermediate results. So this is the construction of a, a merging circuit. You see, again, this <clears throat> um, is a construction by induction, right? So we suppose we have already merging circuits for bitonic sequences of size n over two, and we combine them to a new merger for merging uh, <clears throat> bitonic sequence of size n. Only bitonic sequences are considered here. And then <clears throat> using these recursively constructed bitonic mergers, then we arrive at the recursive construction again <clears throat> for the uh, <clears throat> bitonic sorter, which also involves, <clears throat> by induction hypothesis, uh, sorters for n over two element and <clears throat> its reflection that results in a, <clears throat> produces a, a monotonously decreasing output sequence. This is the famous better bitonic sorter. And I have not justified at all at this stage why this is, makes sense, why this is correct. I will do that in a few minutes. But first, let us analyze the size and the depth of this Batcher's Betonic sorter and Batcher's Betonic merger. So, this is what the current slide is about analyzing the size and the depth. So here we analyze the size of the <clears throat> bitonic sorting gate, defined, constructed recursively, twice the size of sorting n over two elements here and here. Each one has the same size because this is just a reflection of this one. So twice the size plus the size of the merge operation, merging n elements. Now, in order to solve this recurrence, we first need to know what is the size of the bitonic merger asymptotically. So let's devise a, an equation for that size. Again, since this is constructed recursively, it's going to be a recurrence. Namely, the size of a bitonic merger for n elements is O of n. This is these comparison gates there, more precisely n over two comparison gates here, plus twice the size of a merger with n over two elements, twice the size of a merger of n over two elements. And the latter recurrence can be solved easily, right? <clears throat> because the latter recurrence, this is kind of, <clears throat> um, yeah, n over two, and at the next stage of the recurrence, we have n over four, then n over eight, and so on. So that this recurrence goes down 
up to logarithmic depth. Up <clears throat> after logarithmically ma many unrolling of this, the logarithmically many levels, <clears throat> n has boiled down to n <clears throat> divided by two to the log m, so constant. But that we have logarithmically many stages, and in each stage, there's this addition of O of n. So log n times O of n results in the recurrence solution to be n log n asymptotically. And now we've determined the size of the uh, betonic merger for n elements, and we can plug that into here, n log n, and solve that recurrence. This again is a recurrence going down logarithmically many levels, log n layers, each time now not adding O of n, but each time now adding O of n log n. Logarithmically often, so the result is n log squared of n. That's the size of Betcher's betonic sorter. The size of Betcher's betonic merger is n log n. Now, how about the depth? The depth is a parallel running time. We can similarly have such recursive formula for depth as with size. The main difference is now here in size, we count these and these twice because there are two sub-circuits. In parallel running time, these operate in parallel, so the time, the depth, is just one times the depth of the <clears throat> Uh, subsorting circuit. Plus, because this is now sequential after this, plus the depth for the merging operation. And similarly, the depth of the merger is constant because all these comparison gates operate in parallel, plus one times because these two subcircuits operate in parallel, the depth of such a circuit. And these two circuits operate after the comparison gate, so here we have a plus. And again, we can solve the latter recurrence of logarithmic depth now on each level, adding O plus one instead of O plus n, resulting in asymptotic depth O of log n for the merger. And then plugging that into here, this recurrence, Plugging in log n here. Again, logarithmic depth, this time with factor one, so that this gives <clears throat> another logarithmic factor. The resulting depth is log n squared for Betcher's betonic sorter. And this is fast. Remember, we want to sort 1 billion elements then the logarithm squared is roughly 900 cycles for sorting 1 billion elements. And the size is also close to the input size. In fact, as I mentioned before, the optimal size can be at most, at least logarithmic, uh, <clears throat> the optimal depth, and the optimal size, according to Brent's principle, can be at most n log n. So up to a logarithmic factor, to factor of 30 for input size of 1 billion, we're optimal. Betcher's betonic sorter is almost optimal. Now we'll return to the question in a minute whether one can even go down to n log n size and log n uh, time. But uh, first, I still owe you the argument why Betcher's betonic sorter actually makes sense, why it is correct. What's with all these betonic sequences that I um, introduced before? And this is why we employ here the reverse circuit, the circuit that sorts uh, monotonously decreasing the second half, because after these two circuits, the intermediate result is actually a betonic sequence, as you can see. The first one by induction hypothesis produces an increasing sequence, 
The second one produces a decreasing sequence. So together, this is a betonic sequence that is fed into the Batch's betonic merger. Now, why does Batch's betonic merger sort such kind of <coughs> betonic sequence? Let's illustrate that, <coughs> feed that into a merger. And let's check what the first comparison gate does. First comparison gate compares the first element with the first element after the midpoint. Now these two elements are already in order. This one at the uh, <coughs> base of the arrow is smaller than the one at the uh, target of the arrow. So there's not gonna be any swapping operation happening here in this example. Let's also look at the last comparison gate. Last comparison gate compares the last element before the midterm point to the last element at all. Well, these definitely are in wrong order, right? Because this one is the result of a <clears throat> increasing sorting, and this is a result of a decreasing order. So in this example, they're in wrong order which means that the comparison gate, the last comparison gate, will swap them, indicated by this. What about the previous, the intermediate comparison gates? Well, if you imagine these comparison gates moving from here, from left to right, then they become more and more uh, horizontal until at some point it flips and the gate, <coughs> the comparison gates start pointing uh, towards the uh, downwards. First upwards, then more and more shallow, and then finally turning downward until at the end, <coughs> they're pointing, strictly pointing downward. Now what all these comparison gates will do is, um, the first part of the input sequence will remain unchanged as in the black example. The second half will become flipped and flipping entire subsequence means switching these entire subsequences, moving them from left to right. So that after all these comparison gates, indeed, we have two sequences. One betonic, first increasing and then decreasing, and another one, the second half, first decreasing and then increasing, also betonic. And therefore, it is justified to feed these two subsequences recursively into betonic mergers for half the number of elements. So that's a kind of a, a proof by induction on the correctness of Batcher's <coughs> uh, betonic merger and Batcher's betonic sorter um, <coughs> based on the inductive construction of both the merger and the sorter. So to summarize, Batcher's betonic sorting network is correct. Its size is almost optimal, n times log n squared gates. Its depth, its parallel runtime is very fast, log n squared. But the question remains, can we do better? Can we get the size down to n log n according to Brent's principle? Can we get the depth down to log n? This answer to this question had been open for many years until in 1983, Aitai, Komplos, and Simaretti invented, presented the so-called AKS sorting network named after the initials of their names. Now, this may be already 40 years old, but it's still very impressive and very uh, <clears throat> uh, involved construction, a sorting network of optimal size n log n and optimal depth log n. On the other hand, this construction is also very interesting because technically it's not even a construction. The construction employs so-called expander graphs and expander graphs at that time could only be shown to exist um, non-constructively using <clears throat> Paul Elder's so-called <clears throat> uh, 
um, hmm, probabilistic arguments. Maybe by proving that if you take many vertices and throw in a certain number of edges randomly with certain probability, put an edge between two of these vertices or with probability one minus p, omit the edge, then there's a positive probability that the resulting circuit, uh, the resulting graph is, has expansion properties. And without an explicit construction, this is uh, uh, not really useful for engineers to actually build such a graph, not to mention build such a sorting network. Moreover, the constants hidden, at least in the initial construction, were prohibitive, prohibitive large. So asymptotically, it looks like n log n and log, and log n, but the constants hidden and ignored in this big O calculus were so large that um, it didn't make sense to really implement these networks. Batches betonic sorting network, on the other hand, has very small constants. So from as far as I know, uh, even until today, from a practical perspective, batches betonic sorter is uh, preferred over the AKS network. So with that historical background, <coughs> uh, look back, let's uh, uh, conclude and let's <coughs> summarize Chapter nine on parallel algorithms. We have classified parallel computers and parallel algorithms in various ways. We've considered the parallel prefix uh, <clears throat> uh, algorithm or uh, circuit, which is a very powerful, maybe very abstract in general technique. And then we've applied that to obtain <clears throat> Uh, parallel algorithm for graph reachability with uh, parallel runtime log n squared. We've designed and carry look ahead adders with parallel runtime log n for adding n bit numbers. And we've <clears throat> constructed parallel sorting networks, in particular, Batch's Betonic Sorter of uh, depth uh, log n squared for sorting n items. So that's all for today. That's all from chapter nine, parallel algorithm. And next time we'll uh, start with chapter 10 on memory efficient algorithms. And surprisingly, we'll turn out to have close connections, uh, memory efficient algorithms and uh, fast parallel algorithms. So thank you very much for your attention. And see you again next time in chapter 10.